So the first speaker in the session is Deborah Henderson. Uh, Dr. Henderson is Director of the Institute for Sustainable Horticulture and BC Regional Innovation Chair at Kwantlen Polytechnic University and leads an active applied research program in biological and non-chemical management of agricultural and landscape pests and diseases and develops environmentally sound bioproducts and agritech innovations in partnership with industry. Two other themes of her research are new cropping systems and clean technologies for greenhouses. Her partnerships have advanced a broad, broad range of environmentally protective agritech products and processes, all with the ultimate goal of contributing to the sustainability and resilience of agriculture and landscapes. And I'm going to introduce our second speaker as well, so we can just go from one speaker to the next. So Dr. Christine Norona. Noroha, sorry, Research Scientist, Entomology, IPM at Charlottetown Research and Development Center, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Christine obtained her PhD degree in entomology from McGill University. On completion of her degree, she conducted research on the Colorado potato beetle at the University of Laval in Quebec City and at Ag Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge. In 2000, she moved to PEI to take up her current position as Research Scientist Entomology IPM at the Charlottetown Research and Development Center. She's an adjunct professor at UPEI, and her research is focused on developing pest management strategies for major pests on agricultural crops, such as Colorado potato beetles, European corn borer, wireworms, and pollen beetle. So lots of expertise here uh, coming up. Uh, we're really uh, glad that you're here with us and I will pass over to Deborah to start us off. Thank you. Thank you, Marla. <clears throat> and thank you all for inviting me. I'm just gonna share my screen. There, can you see it? We can see it. Oh, good, good. Well, um, there's my title and me, and a little bit about me, although you just heard a little bit. My background is in um, biocontrol with parasitoids and predators. So um, that's what I did for a lot of my career. And then more recently, when I came to Kwanlin, I, I, was, I really wanted to fill a need in integrated pest management for um, microbial control because we just don't have a lot of products. And I work not only in that, but in, in my door walks, plant extract and all kinds of agri innovation. So we partner with industry to do research on anything that will make agriculture and landscapes more sustainable. So I started after my, my education in leading ES Crop Consult, actually founding and leading ES Crop Consult as an integrated pest management service in the Fraser Valley for uh, vegetable and berry crops. The very first one was potato. And I have to say right now, because I saw it was it was a, a concern, we don't have Colorado potato beetle in on the coast. And so I have no direct experience and I can't even talk about it. Um, <laughs> but don't tell anybody we don't have it because I think you, you, you'll all be very jealous. <laughs> so um, when I came to KP, it was to lead a, an, a, an applied research institute. And my goal was to put more biological products into the hands of growers and landscape managers. And one of the things I do in the picture in the slide is I teach at the, we have two uh, farm school programs. And one of them is, is a, a collaboration between the Tawasan First Nation Farm School and um, Kwantlen. And I teach at that one right now. I've done this for about eight or nine years. Uh, and I teach integrated pest management. Deborah, sorry, I'm just gonna interrupt. Your um, screen isn't in presentation mode. It's just, it's oh. showing. Okay. Um, yeah. See also. No. Hmm. So slideshow? Yeah, it was in slideshow. So yeah, it was. It, it, it flashed in, uh, when, in and out when you started. Um, okay, try it again. I'm sharing screen. And is it, is it the same? Is it moving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe stop sharing your screen okay. um, and then start again. Sometimes, again, that, that tech support on off thing. <laughs> sometimes solves problems. It looks like I have choices here. Is, no, is this, this one moving? No, 
Yeah. We'll stop sharing. Oh, this there, up. perfect. We've got it. Yeah. Yes. I Excellent. have no idea why. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. <laughs> mystery, but perfect. Thank you so much. Well, well, Zoom mystery. Um, so in the presentation, I was I'm going to focus on organic brassica pests first and mainly, and, and I'm afraid I'm not going to say too much about spider mites either, but in the question period after, I'd be very happy to talk about that. And, and also, in, there's, I think there's a Q&A tomorrow or a discussion groups tomorrow. Um, cabbage maggot, flea beetles, aphids, and the three lepidoptera. And then maybe you don't have all three, but we have all of them. And so we have to deal with every single one of them. And some new biological control tools that are coming along for the greenhouse. Um, I, I will talk about aphids when I talk about the organic aphids or um, brassica aphids, but I just think there wasn't really enough time to deal with them properly. But on our farm school, we have hoop houses, caterpillar tunnels, and, and also row covers. And I've also worked with organic growers in fields up to 30 acres, which I know probably sounds fairly small to some of you, but that's, that's a large field for us. And then what are the IPM strategy essentials when you're using biological control? What do I try and convey to my students um, that they need to think about and know about biological control? So I call that the three moths, the trinity, the imported cabbage worm, which is the butterfly on the left and the, the uh, cabbage looper, which is in the middle and the diamondback moth on the right. And then the other ones, of course, the uh, maggot and the flea beetle and aphids. So cabbage maggot first, um, I know this, this is a, a real challenging one. Um, I, I like it for one reason and that's because it shows shows up early in the spring and I can show my students, we can go and pull up some roots of, of brassica weeds and I can show them the, the larvae right on the weeds and, and they can usually find them with no, without any trouble. It's, uh, it's, it attacks all kinds of brassica, but even some other crops when, when they're numerous, when the population is numerous. It looks like a house fly. It's pretty in, in, in size, you know, it's pretty hard to figure out who's who there. But it can fly up to two kilometers in search of a host plant and, and lay 50 to 200 eggs. So that's where its um, great population increase comes from. There are some ways to predict it. Um, one of the best ways <clears throat> is using degree days. And there are a lot of degree day models around and I'm not gonna go through exactly how that works, but it's there's a lower threshold for any insect and any plant actually to start growing. And if you keep the, the temperature data from January the 1st, you can accumulate the number of, of heat units or degree days. And at certain point, um, a, a pest will reliably show up or emerge from the ground. So if for, for cabbage maggot flies emerging from the soil, it's 200 degree days. And there's a little map on there, that's Manitoba. And it shows at a, a certain point, um, the degree days above five degrees centigrade uh, with a 25% variation for the whole province. So you can see the dark, the dark green is actually the cooler and the, and the red is, is the warmer. So there are more degree days in the warmer area and there are fewer degree days accumulated for the same date in the dark green areas. Another way to do that, and it's, it works almost as well, but it's a little less sophisticated is using phenological models. So at a 200 degree days, if you can find that point, what is happening on the farm? Are there some weeds that are blooming? Is something coming up for the first time? What else is happening? Because plants also respond to the same temperature uh, that the insects do. One that, that you use if you can really, if you're really good at identifying the um, cabbage maggot adult from all the other flies out there is the yellow sticky card traps. And uh, certainly with monitoring services, people who do provide those services are able to find that little gray band on its thorax and count the number of um, cabbage maggot moths compared to whatever else sticks to the trap. And that'll tell you when they're flying, which means that's when they're laying eggs. And that's when you have to worry. So this is um, this was a study that was done by Bob Burnett at Agriculture Canada some years ago uh, using exclusion fencing. And he actually developed exclusion fencing for more than one pest, and it's starting off with carrot rust fly, and it was very, very effective. But the fence, it, it's vertical, and then it has a, um, a, a um, an angled edge on it. So the idea of the flies fly horizontally and they go up and then they come into this, this little roof and then they have to go back down and then do a loop and they don't get over the fence. And it actually um, is fairly fairly effective for uh, rust fly. 
So we, he tested it with cabbage maggot as well. And the interesting thing was there were two fields, this one with the fence and another one very similar size to it without a fence. And they all had about six insecticide treatments. Um, and this is not something you would do in an organic field, but uh, the idea was to compare the impact of the fence and on the population building up and where it was. And it turned out that the distance from the nearest fence, uh, always on the edges of the field, you've got more cabbage maggots. And in the lower right graph, you see from the corner of the field, and this is the unfenced field, to the center, you had a decrease in the number of cabbage maggots that were found and also the damage that was found. And in the fenced field on the left, you saw almost the same number on the edge, but it decreased a lot quicker towards the middle. So overall, the unfenced edges of the field that, that was just treated with a pesticide lost 80, 85% of the crop to culls and the fenced only 23%. So with a threshold of 10%, I think that whole field actually that was unfenced was lost. And uh, so, but it, it, the downside of this is it's a fairly expensive fix. And, and once you put that fence up, you wanna use it for a number of years. And that's why he was working on different crops. But um, that's one, one idea which you may or may not find useful. I like trap crop strategies a lot. Um, you have to be aware that for, for cabbage maggot that though those spring weeds are going to be your trap crop in the spring and they will lure all the adults as soon as they emerge. If your crop's not up, the weeds will take them. So using those weeds as a trap crop is something that you could actually use to your advantage. But you do have to get them out of the field because what they'll do is they'll lay eggs near the base of the plant and those larvae will go down into the, the plant roots and then they will emerge later as adults and lay more eggs and your crop will be there by then. So either you remove those weeds or um, if you have pigs, so this is something that we, we have at our farm school, we have pigs and it's a 30 acre um, certified organic farm and the pigs are part of the farm and they actually will eat the weeds and dig up, dig them up and, and root and eat the roots. So they're actually quite useful for getting rid of um, cover crops. So you can either mow them to keep them so that the cabbage maggot doesn't actually find them in the spring and go somewhere else, or you can use them as a trap crop, but you have to be aware that you need to get rid of them somehow. But if you can plant your trap crop, say of radish, then you have more control over what's happening and it's a very fast growing and the maggots will come into it. And then you can either dig it up or you can actually, if you have pigs, the pigs will very, very happily eat those radishes for you. So another one that comes a little bit later, um, the crucifer flea beetle, um, it's, it's, a, it's a nice jumping, shiny black beetle with a bit of a bluish sheen. And it's not a native, it was introduced to North America and it's become the most common beetle on brassica in Canada. And in the prairies, of course, there's canola has a lot uh, of concern about beetles. So you have amazing photos there and all kinds of great information. And the damage is, of course, to seedlings and also leafy crops. And, and they do, especially to the seedlings, they can do a lot of damage and, and cause them to be stunted and not grow. And the adults do the shot hole damage where the, the larvae feed on the roots. And you can have two or three generations a year. So culturally, what you can do for flea beetle is to delay the seeding because those overwinter, they overwinter as adults and they emerge and they, they'll just find the first food crop. And once they die, there's a, there's a little lag and then they, they emerge again um, from the soil because they've, they've laid eggs and, and those larvae um, mature and then uh, emerge. Uh, but you can delay your seeding until after those, those first overwintering adults die if it's in your, your plan. And then you, they get established before the next group of adults comes in and does the shot hole feeding. And once the plants are established, they can usually tolerate a fair bit of root feeding as well. So the other thing is, is controlling the cruciferous weeds. And, and also think about if you have any cruciferous weeds in your cover crop, because this is something that happened at the farm school. It, it's also a research site. So someone was, was doing cover crop research and they put brassica in their cover crops. And so they, it just, that's where they were and they built up there. And as soon as the cover crop was mowed, they went right into the crop. So uh, be aware of what you have in your cover crops because crucifers are sometimes desirable in cover crops. 
Live mulches of clover, um, I haven't seen this one in action, but I, it's, it's reported to reduce damage, but it can also reduce yield. And companion planting with marigolds, um, I mean, everybody seems to think that marigolds are great. They're great for nematode companion planting. Um, I haven't seen a lot of positive uh, impact for things other than nematodes, and they could potentially also reduce some yield. And I do like the trap crop with the radish idea, as long as you can get rid of it at the right time. And rotation is good, but they fly well, so they have to be fairly far away. But with the rotation, at least they're not emerging in the ground where their crop is coming up. So they have to fly somewhere to get to the crop. So getting rid of the trap crop is, I think, the biggest challenge. And if it's on the leaves, you can usually destroy it with mowing. But if it's in the roots, like the cabbage maggot or the flea beetles, um, you know, this, the solution at our, our school or farm school is to send in the pigs. And, and they love it. They're better than plowing because they actually eat the roots. They don't just chop them up. And they are part of the IPM program. More mainstream strategies, of course, are row covers, and they work very well. There are the remake kind of floating row covers. Um, and also there, there's this other one called Protected. I don't know if anyone of, of you is using it. It's quite a sturdy one and it'll last for a number of years. We did a, a trial one year with it at, and, and at the end of the rows, we, we sort of spread it out so that intending for the tractors to drive over it and the tractor did drive over it and it didn't get holes. It actually did stand up extremely well. So it could be used over and over. And this, as there's a company in Quebec that sells this particular product. Sometimes you get more weed and disease issues under there because you can't really see what's going on and monitoring gets difficult. And there are some biopesticides that can work on the flea beetle. And I think it's probably the maggot is a little bit early. Um, at least the first generation is to use a biopesticide. But the one that I've had the most experience with is Entrust. And it's a spinosad. It's a, a bacteria that produces a metabolite called spinosins, and they're, they've been formulated into a product and they kill, they're actually fairly good at killing the beetles. And the graph that you see was um, the company that I started some years ago. And we were looking at, um, I think it was potato flea beetle in uh, control, so untreated, and Novador, which is a product that's available in the US, but we were hoping it would be available here, but it's not, and, and trust. And, we got, so the number of, of feeding holes um, in the tubers was, was our measure. And you can see that the control had quite a few of 12 holes in a tuber is actually beyond a, an acceptable level for a consumer. And Novador reduced it, but Entrust reduced it the most and actually got it below that threshold of, of consumer acceptance. So it is a useful pesticide for flea beetle and uh, it is available and it's OMRI certified. Experientially, um, I know that the best control is to get rid of that first generation. And usually organic growers are using Entrust because each of those females will produce hundreds of eggs and then the next generation is bigger and the next generation is bigger. And unlike cabbage maggot, they don't really take a break in the middle of the season, they just keep going. So your third generation can be quite large and, and any of your leafy crops can be extremely damaged. Um, the strategy that works both for cabbage maggot and flea beetle, rotation, of course, so that none of them are emerging out of the soil where your crop is. And then physically cover your crop once it's, it starts to emerge when those adults are flying. And if you can combine that for the, the maggot with a radish trap crop and even for flea beetle um, outside the crop, then you'll draw them away even from your, your covered crop. Because if you're an insect, you, you have a very small brain and you're programmed to do a few things. And one of them is to, is to find food. And another one is to lay eggs and, and also mate. So you have a pretty you know, limited repertoire of activities, of, of actions. And if, you need, if you're in the find food mode or look for a place to oviposit and there's a, a crop that's covered with a rene and, you, and it's in there and they can smell it, they'll just keep going at it over and over all day. They have nothing else to do all day except find the hole, find the hole, find the hole, find the hole. And, they, and if they don't find the hole, they'll just keep looking and looking and looking for the hole. So when you do have a hole in your reme, that's where your, your pests are going to get in. So do a really good job of covering it and, and you won't get them in. And it works extremely well. 
And then if you have pigs, send them in to clean up the radishes or dig them up and, and, and get rid of them if you're using radishes to trap crop. And it doesn't have to be a huge trap crop, just somewhere near your crop, either coming up early or outside the, the covered area. And that'll keep the populations from increasing year after year. One thing I see in our, our farm school is the populations do increase a lot. So we've sort of seen it all there. So aphids in field brassica and greenhouses, they're different species and different colors tend to be different species, but they all do similar sorts of things. They fly, they disperse themselves in May and August. So they, they produce wings at those times and they fly. And all summer, including May and August, those aphids are females and they'll produce a live young every few hours. And the warmer it gets, the faster they reproduce and they don't need to mate to do that. So they just they pop a, a baby every few hours. But they are kind of big, fat, juicy, yummy creatures. And so many predators and parasitoids eat them. Now they're gonna be a lot easier to control before they get too numerous. So you've gotta find them early and that's the real key. So we did one aphid trap crop experiment in um, organic broccoli. It was a 30 acre field and it was a few different, the first year where they planted a few different varieties. And so we noticed that some appeared to be aphid magnets and we thought, hmm, what if we use those as a trap crop? And so the grower put a small, I think 1% of seed in and planted the next field. And so, though, and they certainly did, they were magnets for, for aphids and all the predators came in. However, the challenge was they had to be found individually when you mix them up with the, the seed, you don't know, exactly sure where they're gonna grow. And so then you had to find them all with a, a backpack sprayer and use safer soap, which actually works pretty well on aphids. And of course we missed some and um, the aphid feeders showed up a little too late to do the job. And then we needed more sprays. But lessons learned, um, you can't trust aphid predators to clean up cabbage aphid. They don't really like cabbage aphid. It's got that waxy coating on it. And while they can sometimes be dependent on in other crops to, to go after clean aphids and, and clean them up, um, cabbage aphid, they just sort of said, yeah, maybe not. But you can see this picture. There are some. There's a, a parasitoid. The puffy brown one is parasitized. And then there's a little um, orangey worm in there, a couple of little orangey worms. Um, they are phytolides. They eat aphids. And they're really good. In the field, they're less useful to release than in the greenhouse. In a greenhouse or a hoop house, you can release those kinds of predators and they stick around and they, they can be quite helpful. But really the key is find them early. And my experience is that in the, in the hoop houses, especially things will, will move a lot quicker and you don't expect them that early, but they'll, they'll show up and then it's almost too late by the time you find them. You need to find them very early. Spot treat if you can. And if you can afford some predators or parasitoids, the aphidolides is pretty good because they search very well. They're a little parasitic wasp. You can buy them. Um, it, it's just, it's really a balance and, and with, with aphids. So you just have to mostly be on top of them, find them as soon as you can. So the loopers and the, the lepidopteran, there are three and we have three in, in numerous, numerous quantity. I don't know if you have all of them all of the time. But the cabbage looper is, is one that, that's that green loopy one that uh, overwinters in the southern US. And it, we think it probably overwinters in greenhouses in Canada, but it, it's just too cold even on the coast for, for it to overwinter. And some years, many moths arrive and some years not very many. And it's quite variable. Usually we have quite a few. I don't know if, if you occasionally have lots of them here or you just regularly have a few. And they'll have two or three generations uh, and they're overlapping, so you will have larvae of any size. The moth is a very brown, not very pretty, not, doesn't fly in the daytime, hard to see the moth unless you, you scare it up from the, the foliage. The little eggs are really beautiful little round things, but the loopers are very distinctive and they chew bigger and bigger holes depending on how big they are. And the holes can get extremely large and they can just burrow right through a cabbage. And the other thing is that they leave that frass, that brown or black, um, material that's a contaminant, that's their poop. And some years there are natural baculovirus infections that decimate the populations in that lower left-hand picture is, is a, an infected looper. It's been infected with a baculovirus and it just turns into glistening liquid. 
those are useful things. I'm going to talk more about those in a minute. So the other another one of the Trinity is the diamondback moth. And it overwinters in the US as well, and it arrives north, migrates north. And usually the worst of it is from the middle of June to the middle of August in Canada, again, overlapping generations. And they lay 160 eggs and they live for a couple of months. The whole the damage is really smaller and it starts on the underside of the leaves. And the cabbage looper baculovirus has some efficacy against it, but you need it at a higher rate. Dipel is effective. You have to use, um, Again, they're, they're fairly small, but any lepidopter on the smaller side is more susceptible to, to BT or Dipel. And there's a new registration in Canada that just came out um, not very long ago, a year or two ago. Uh, it's, it's Again, it's a Bacillus thuringiensis BT or similar to Dipel, but it's a different subspecies. And it's labeled, Diamondback moth is labeled on, the, on the, the product. It's called Zentari. I don't know anything about it. I haven't had any personal experience with it yet, but I'm, I welcome it because I know Dipel is, it has its, its issues, but it's, it's probably our most useful product. And Zentari is also army certified. So I would, I would certainly look at that this year. The imported cabbage worm also um, probably doesn't overwinter in, uh, in the prairies anyway, it could potentially overwinter on the coast, but it's another invasive species. The female lives three weeks, produces up to 400 eggs, and there are two or three generations in a growing season. And it's a butterfly, so it's out in the daytime. It's the white one with the dots uh, that kids like to chase around and catch. And, um, but it produces these lovely velvety caterpillars that make nice big holes. There is a granulosis virus, which is different from the, um, the looper virus, which can cause local uh, infection. It isn't available commercially yet. It could be, it's, it's known. Uh, Dipel is also effective on the smaller larvae. And with Dipel, you've got to get the coverage. They're underneath the leaf, as are the diamondback moth and sometimes the cabbage looper. So you've got to get that coverage underneath. But it can be effective. I've seen it, Dipel work quite well at our farm school. So there's the Centauri. Um, it's just a different strain. It has all of the three labeled on the on the on the label and you just have to get uniform coverage and deposition on all plant services which is the same as dipel so the pest seasons you have transplants and at the spring in there or seeding and they're mostly susceptible to cabbage maggot and flea beetle mid-season you've got all of those plus the lepidoptera plus the aphids and later in the season the same thing but the cabbage maggot also can return so when you're, when you're doing your planting plan, um, one thing that pests really like is consistent food all season. And so you will have con uh, con sequential plantings. Um, it'll be the most problem in the middle of the season, which you may already know. And infestations from mature plants will infest young plants. So the better you take care of those early ones, the better you're gonna be able to take care of the later ones. And there will also be weeds. And remember they're a reservoir. And, and see what you can do with them between crops or, or in the spring to keep them down as much as possible. And there also will be predators and parasitoids who love aphids, but they may not be enough to control your aphids. So you might have to do some interventions. So for a, a field brassica crop, um, an IPM timeline could be when your transplants come up, you're gonna have maggot out there, presumably if it's a spring one. So you want to cover them to protect them from that and from the flea beetle. And then after five or six weeks, you can take the remay off and then start Dipel or Zentari sprays um, every seven to 10 days, depending on the pressure. And you might, have to, you might have to do some aphid management as well, just monitor, monitor, monitor. And then when you take the crop out, because all those pests are going to be in the soil or on the crop residue, if you've got pigs, send the pigs in or do your best to get rid of that or destroy that residue so that there's nothing left for the pest to survive in. And if I have time, maybe I don't, um, baculoviruses are a, tool, a new tool and we have some experience with them that I wanted to share. They're everywhere. They're very, very non-toxic to you and everyone and every other insect out there, all the biologicals. They're so specific. It's been their, their strength and their weakness really. So what happens is the Larva has to ingest it. There's a little particle on the leaf and has to ingest it. And then inside 
the host replicates and releases to the environment more virus when the host dies. And we, one isolate of bacula virus for Looper was isolated in BC um, around 2000. And Silver Technologies, which is now Endomat Canada, registered as Lupex. And it's available for field work, field crop use, because we did the work, which I'm going to describe in a moment. So we did it at our Tawasan Farm School, and we looked at um, broccoli and cabbage, and we, we planted rows and treated we had row covers as one treatment, Lupex alone, and then we did it in combination with BT, uh, which was Dipel or alternating. And interestingly, uh, this is broccoli on the left, cabbage on the right. The very low line, that, um, the, the gray one is, is the row cover. So row cover one, both times, no, no hand, hands down, just one. The untreated, the black line is, is what you would get if you don't do any treatment at all. And that was also the worst, which makes sense. And in the middle there, um, Dipel worked very well um, and alternating Dipel with Lupex worked well and Lupex alone didn't work as well as when it was alternated or combined with Dipel. And we also discovered that droplet size matters a lot. In, in those three circles, in a droplet of 600 um, micro, meter, micro, microns, you get around 6,000 particles of virus in the 50 micron, you get 20, and in the 25 micron um, sprayed droplet, you get about two. So you can spread it much better with a smaller droplet with the same volume, with a lower volume of water, but the same amount of product. And so we thought, can, we wondered if we could improve the um, efficacy of the product by using an ultra low volume sprayer. So we, we used the low volume rather than the ultra low, and it was designed actually for small farms. So there are two sprayers. A high, high volume sprayer was a green gorilla, about 800 liters breaker, and our low volume was about 10 liters per hectare. And we were spraying Lupex alone for control of um, cabbage looper, and we actually infested the plants, so we knew how many were on there. And what happened was, um, in days after the spray, the high volume, the proportion, the, there were more dead ones, so green is, is the low volume, and high number is good. There are more dead ones every day after the spray, the first spray, and then we did a second spray. And again, we had more dead ones in, um, in the, the, low, the low volume sprayer than we did in the high volume sprayer. And overall, we got, with the low volume sprayer, we got earlier mortality of larvae, and we got more mortality, and, and it was significant. So it does, for, for you know, a fairly small, change in how you're applying the product, you're actually getting a better kill. And the potential for this is, for bacular viruses, is, is that we can actually blend them in the mix. And this is a, an area that the company and we have been talking about for a while. Can we blend um, a bacular virus for each of those pests, um, because they're all lipidopter, they all have a virus, and into one product that can be used for field brassica. So this is again the, the strategy: use weeds or um, cover or, or radish as a trap crop and cover your first plantings. Remove the cover after four to six weeks, but then start using something to prevent those cater caterpillars from building up the dipel or zentari, and then cover subsequent plantings and mow or cut brassica weeds, and then feed anything to the pigs that you can take out of the field or get the pigs in to dig out the roots. And in, in closing, um, I, if you start to think like an insect, you'll start to see how they have their advantage. Like they have very tiny brains, as I mentioned, and you have a big brain, so you ought to be smarter. And they just do a few things, but they do them very well. So if you can think, what is it they have to do at this point in their life, and then figure out how you can stop them from doing that, um, you're going to have a nice, successful uh, IPM strategy. So... Other key things are start scouting early because biologicals don't work like chemicals. You can't rescue really with a biological. You have to prevent, prevent, prevent. Keep your notes and put your, your year on your notes because sometimes the notes look really the same from one year to the next. So that when you can, you try something new, you can go back and look, oh, and when I did that, it actually made a difference, you know, a year later. Um, when you try a new thing, include a control. So include an area that you haven't done that treatment so that you can compare the results. 
and then learn from your experiences. Um, if something didn't work, that's that's good. I mean, only because you can learn that that didn't work and you're not going to do it again. So develop a strategy and then evaluate it every year and then revise it and do it again and do it again until you get something that is, is working for you. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Perfect, thank you so much, Deborah. You covered a lot of ground and provided some really great strategies and um, you know, recommendations there, um, as well as the sort of research findings to uh, show the efficacy of the various, um, you know, the various strategies. So we really appreciate that. Um, and before we take questions, we're gonna move on to Christine and Christine is gonna do her presentation next uh, and then we'll circle back for questions. So over to you, Christine. And you're on mute just so you know. Oh, I'm still on mute. There we okay. go. Perfect. So, um, can you see my screen? No. Uh, no, we can't. No, not yet. Okay. I'm just gonna go up here and try this again. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Trying it, but it's not working. Hmm. All right. Uh, just, just to well, our tech support people on the call, uh, does does Christine have? Is she able to share her screen? Is she given the proper access? Okay. There we go. I was able to share it a little while ago, and yeah, now I can. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. Um, it's coming up on my screen, but. <laughs> and just are you clicking the share screen at the okay. bottom? Yes, yes, I am. Yeah, I know. It's okay. Any suggestions or help from uh, the tech can... people on the call? Sure, yeah. Answers? Christine, if you want, I can. I have a copy of your presentation, so I'm happy to share it for you if you like. Okay, I guess that's the only way to go right now. Yeah, the only uh, thing I can think of is maybe just like you would leave and try com coming back. Okay, leave the leave the uh, leave everything and come back. I I think it's probably maybe just we'll have Deb show the presentation. I can do that. I don't know Deb, why Deb it's not show showing it. me my screen. Yeah, Deb, you can get just... Deb to show and just let her know when you need. Yeah. to switch the slide. Okay. Um, it's too bad that I can't do that, but yeah. okay. <laughs> Let me see now. I'll just try this again. Okay, I can see this. Why am I getting this? Just a second. Okay, cancel. All right. I'll do this one more time. Still not working. Okay, there we go. Are you seeing something, Noah? No, well, no, but we're seeing Deb is sharing her, her screen now. Deb so showing, okay. The presentation. So, all right, so okay. I'll just go according to this. So um, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me to, to present here. Um, so today I'm gonna just talk about wireworms and the type of research that we have been doing in PEI and, um, uh, to, to uh, control wireworms. So I'll start with what are wireworms. They are the, the larvae of click beetles and they live for three to five years in the soil. Um, they damage, they can damage several crops, as many crops that they, they will damage. And um, most of the damage to root crops can can render the crop unmarketable. And I've seen this happen where potatoes, uh, potato um, crops have gone to fields and the farms actually have to uh, uh, plow their crop in because it's so badly damaged. So um, th these, this is the type of damage that we see. This is a cabbage transplant and this was cabbages that were grown here. And this is not a mist, this is actually uh, be, uh, wire worms that have taken out this 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 cabbage, and then you have uh, corn, and you also have um, have cranberry and your other fields. Are, are you are you uh, switching my 
my um my slides hello yep you bet i am i'm okay. i'm on wirewood wireworm damage to various crops okay so next slide please i forgot to tell you that sorry <laughs> next slide <laughs> Uh, as carrots and we have uh, damage to carrots and uh, as well as onions and um, potatoes you can see the amount of damage that they do next slide please um, so just a little bit about the life cycle of wire ones this they are uh, the click beetles they only live for about two and a half months uh, they come out in the in the fall and in the spring sorry early spring and they lay their eggs uh, in the soil the larvae um, hatch and then they feed on the, on the roots and the seeds of any plants that are available in the field they'll grow over the summer and they'll start damaging the the, the root crops in the in the fall but unlike most insects that will actually pupate and become adults these ones what they do is they actually go deep into the soil to overwinter and then the following spring they will come back up and they'll start feeding on any roots and new transplants that that have been planted and they'll go through this cycle and they'll feed all summer long and in the fall go back into into um, to overwinter and this happens for three to five years depending on the species and after three to five years, they will pupate and become adults again, and the adults will come out and lay eggs. Now, this three to five year cycle is what causes a big problem because once a field is infected, once leg eggs are laid in the field, you start to have, you always have problems for three to five years. And then usually adults coming out, they will continue to lay eggs in that same field. In Alberta and Saskatchewan, the main, the main species that we're finding is Hypnoidus bicolor. This is the next slide. Um, uh, Salatosomus uh, destructor and Lemonius californicus. These are the, the main uh, species that we find in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Next slide, slide please. Um, here you can see that there is, there are, um, there's quite a, big difference in sizes. Salatosomus destructor, you can see it's a big, it's a fairly big wireworm, even the, the, the larva is pretty big and the adult is as well. Whereas Hypnidus bicolor color is really small. So they range in size uh, quite a bit. Uh, you can get some more information from the field guide that, that we have, best wireworms uh, in um, the Canadian prairies, and it was published by Agriculture Canada. So if you want, you could get this, this field guide and to give you some more information about wireworms. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so organic farming, we have, it's a big challenge. And the challenge lies in the fact that there are extreme, uh, there's, there's no, there's no uh, insecticides that can be used. Um, so the only way to control this pest is through cultural control techniques. Um, they feed on a wide variety of crops, so that increases the challenge for organic farmers. Next slide, please. So my research has focused for the last 15 years or more on cultural control techniques. So I'm going to I'm going to just give you an overview of some of my research. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is susceptibility of potato varieties. So we have we looked at susceptibility of 20 potato varieties. There was no insecticide used in this in this trial, so insecticide was protection by insecticide was not considered. It was solely how the varieties behave. And what we found was that there's two areas of the spectrum. We have Eva, Norlins, um, AC Schiller, Shepherdies. These are all on the high scale. They're very, very susceptible. And then you have the FL varieties, Green Mountain. These are chipping varieties, FL varieties. They are on the lower scale. So it's good to know what varieties are 
um, less susceptible because if there is a field that has wireworm populations, it's better to go into that field and actually plant an FL variety and or Green Mountain or Gold Rush instead of going and putting a Red Norlin. Now, through my experience, I know they love Red Norlin, so uh, that's uh, that's something to stay away from if you ha if there is a field that has wireworm populations. Um, it is absolutely not recommended to take a field that is in sod or hay for several years, work it in, and then plant a, a, one of the cash crops. Because when you have a, a field that has sod in it for several years, wireworm populations just keep um, keep increasing in there. And if you take that sod out, you plow it in, and you plant your crop, it's going to cause big problems because the wire ones are going to come and feed on that crop so it's best not to do put a cash crop in but the best approach would be to use a wireworm suppressive crop i'm going to discuss a little bit with you um give you some more information on wireworm suppressive crops but that's that's the best approach to um to control wire ones. Uh, so some of the crop rotations uh, where we looked at suppressive crops, one of the crops we looked at was brown mustard and the other one was buckwheat. And we grew it, the first time we did this study, we went to the extreme. We had two crops, two years. The reason why we put in the second crop was because um, the, the farmers were not, did not want a crop to grow a crop that would go to seed and then the seed would become a problem for the following year. But we wanted to have a cover for the winter because we didn't want soil erosion to happen. So we planted this, this uh, mustard and the buckwheat, we disked it in and then we planted a second crop which went until December. And uh, so we had, soil, uh, uh, we had coverage of the soil for the whole year and also the other reason was to have enough uh, the, the crop there for the wire ones to feed on. And what we found was, next slide please, uh, what we found was that the brown mustard and the buckwheat gave us really good uh, good suppression of wire worms and the, the, the marketable yield, the damage was very low and marketable yield was really high when you compared it with barley. And even the number of tubers that were not damaged was fairly high, uh, was fairly low, um, high, sorry, as compared to barley, and the number of tubers lost was, was low. So we knew that this strategy worked. Uh, the growers here have started adopting the strategy and they have actually managed to decrease their populations in the field. But it's extreme. It's a lot of um, money to buy two crops to plant two crops a year. So we've done some more studies where we found just one year is sufficient. You don't have to do that um, uh, to grow two, two crops in, in a year. And now the mustard that we used was brown mustard. Now, it's very important the type of mustard that you're gonna use. It has to be brown mustard, not yellow mustard, not white mustard, not Ethiopian mustard, but brown mustard. And it's because of the chemicals that are present in brown mustard, it's Brassica gymsea. And the variety we used was either Centennial or Duchess variety. Uh, buckwheat, we grew the Mancan variety, and that's the rates that we were growing it at. We found over the years, we have found that you can grow it for one year or two years, and you still get wire worm suppression. But it all depends on what the population is. Very high populations do it two years, low populations, one year is sufficient. Um, we always fertilized our, our crop. The reason being is that a crop that is fertilized is a healthy crop and the healthier the crop, the more of this chemical it's going to produce, which is going to um, suppress your wire worms. So it's, it's very essential to treat it like a crop and actually grow it, grow a healthy crop. Uh, buckwheat is not very frost tolerant, so it has to be planted very late in the season. Uh, next uh, slide, please. 
So we had um, mustard. Uh, so how do you manage your crop, right? Uh, the, the rotation crop. So for the mustard and the buckwheat, we mowed it, we disked it, or we harvested it. And you grow it for one year or two years. All these strategies work. Uh, for mowing the mustard, we actually used a flail mower. We tested different mowing strategies. So four inches, uh, flail to four inches, eight inches, and 12 inches. And we were looking at regrowth. So the reason for regrowth was because a lot of times these plants will regrow, but they will actually start producing seed and they become a problem the following year. So that's why we didn't want them to produce seed. So we wanted to mow it at a, at a level where it's not going to, to produce seed, but it's still going to be alive and the wire worms that are going to go feed on it um, will still get the, the chemicals that are in the roots. So we did, so this is what we found. We found regrowth at eight and, and um, eight and 12 inch cut. Um, disc mower, we found the same regrowth, but there was a lot of debris that was left on the, on the surface. And then it was a problem with decomposition that happened later in the year. And we also did the rotary mower uh, where we, we got at four inch cut, we didn't get a lot of regrowth. Uh, we got some regrowth at, uh, at eight and then at 12, uh, 12 inch cut. Um, so there was regrowth at both eight and 12 inches. So we, we recommended to the farmers that they cut at six inch inches if they want, if they want to keep the field and keep that crop in the field. It was, we recommended six inches. And um, we found that, like I mentioned, the disc mower, there was a lot of debris in it, and it was a problem later on with the deterioration of that cut material. Next slide, please. So we were interested in finding, okay, so we did this, we clipped it, we mowed it, we incorporated it. What does it, what effects does it have on the wire ones? So looking at the mustard crop here, it didn't matter if you clipped it, you incorporated it into the into your field as green manure, or or you took it for seed. You would still get wireworm suppression, and that was very good for us because now we didn't have to go and uh, work the soil several times. You could just clip clip it. You still have soil cover sub cover, and it and still get wireworm suppression. So we did the same thing with uh, with buckwheat. Um, here we have a cabbage field where we had huge numbers of wireworms, over 20 wireworms per plant in this cabbage field. And we, did, we used uh, buckwheat and our, our control was, was um, barley. We mowed and we um, disked the barley and the buckwheat. Um, and we found the same, same numbers. Like we found the same information we got was that if you disc the buckwheat or you mow it, numbers of wireworms would uh, is is reduced as compared to barley or mowed um, a mowed or disc. So it doesn't matter if it's mowed or it's disced into the soil. There is still wireworm suppression in these in these crops. Next slide, please. Uh, what was very interesting to us was for the buckwheat um, was that we also got suppression of root lesion nematode. And once again, it didn't matter if the buckwheat was disked, flailed, or if it was taken for seed. And that was very good. We were, we were really happy to, to see that. It's giving us more than just wireworm uh, suppression. So the bottom line is treat the buckwheat and mustard as a crop. It's very essential to have those chemicals in there that the crop healthy and and um, and and um, producing these chemicals. Um, so next slide, please. Um, why does brown mustard work? That's something that so brown mustard has an allele glucosinolate in it, and it also has in its tissues 
an enzyme which is called myronase. And when when the uh, mustard is is mulched when it's disked into the soil, this myronase and the glucosinolate meet and they produce a, 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 the I, they produce uh, isothiocyanate. Now isothiocyanate is actually a, um, a, a biofumigant and we have found here that whenever we do this we found less verticillium and fewer nematodes in, in the soil. So it's actually act, acting as a biofumigant if it is dissed into, this, into the soil. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing with brown mustard is that it has this 2-phenylethyl, which is a chemical in large quantities in its root. And when the wire worm feeds on it, it actually gets sick and it, it's toxic to the, to the wire worm. So we know why brown mustard works and why we're getting wire worm suppression. But why buckwheat? So we started with, we did this lab study where we looked at wire worms in the buckwheat. We took these really tiny wire worms that had just hatched. Um, so they're, they're the neonates, small wire worms, and we put them into buckwheat and mustard, uh, buckwheat and um, barley crops, and we looked to see what was going on. And as expected, the number of, uh, of uh, percentage of survival was very low in the buckwheat as compared to the barley. But when you look at when you looked at what was going on, you could see that the barley fed wire worms were a lot bigger than the buckwheat fed wire worms. And this was this was something new to us because we didn't know how buckwheat was working. So these both these wire worms started off at the same size and it really made a difference in which one they were feeding on. And eventually the buckwheat wire worms, after a while of feeding on buckwheat, they die. So we know how buckwheat works. Um, so looking at just the crop rotation strategy, um, what's really important is no evaluate a field, every field, like every field needs to be evaluated separately because because each field has its own population of wire worms. So it needs to be evaluated and based on the number of wire worms you have, then decisions have to be made about management. Is brown mustard and buckwheat going to be grown only for one year or two years? Is it going to be uh, mowed in or is it going to be um, uh, incorporated or it's going to be harvested. This all depends on what pressure and what we are looking for, uh, what's the benefits we are looking for when we plant these rotation crops. Uh, as far as mustard is concerned, if, if the field has disease problems, then it's best to mulch it and, and mow it and disc it into the soil so that you get the disease and nematode um, suppression. Um, and mustard will give you a little bit of biofumigation when it's when it's growing, but the levels are very low. And there is a market for both buck, uh, brown mustard and buckwheat. Next slide, please. Um, so we know that those two crops work. We were very happy with them. Growers have started using them. They've got their production and populations, wire worm populations. We wanted to see what else we could grow. Um, so sorghum Sudan grass growers want to grow that because it produces a lot of, uh, uh, it helps with soil organic matter. So we wanted to look at sorghum Sudan grass and we looked at flax was one of the other crops. Um, so we planted it in 2009 and in 2020 we had we planted potatoes. Next slide please. Um, the percentage of uh, tuber damage is what I'm going to show you here and you can see in the buckwheat the number of tubers that percentage of tubers that had no damage was much higher in the buckwheat and also significantly higher in the sorghum Sudan grass when you compare the flax and the barley. Next slide. Uh, 
And when we look at number of holes per tuber, here we find that the number of holes was significantly lower in the buckwheat, which is what we expected. But it was also low in the sorghum Sudan grass. Not as good as buckwheat, but sorghum Sudan grass is also giving some level of wire worm uh, damage control. Um, so we wanted to see then, okay, so buckwheat, if given a choice, would, would, uh, would, um, why ones actually feed on buckwheat if they had a choice? And there's some method to this madness of mine. Um, we, um, and what we found was very surprising. They actually like buckwheat. They'd actually choose to feed on buckwheat, even though it's not good for them. So this to us was really good information because we decided, well, you know, we could actually put it in a crop mix because in for soil health you need many different crops not just one monoculture it's better to have different crop mixes to to actually build your soil so we thought why why can't we do this we should try to see if it would work in a crop mix but buckwheat has allelopathic properties so what i mean with that is that if there's a crop growing beside buckwheat, buckwheat actually suppresses crops, suppresses other plants. And that's why it's really good for weed control as well. Um, so we wanted to see what effects it would have. So we did this study where we looked at 100%, 50%, 35% and 20% of the field rate of buckwheat mixed with these other crops, sunflower, sorghum, Sudan grass, rye grass and alfalfa. Next slide, please. Um, and we did it in this in these boxes in the greenhouse to see what we could, what we would find. And we introduced wire worms into each of these boxes as well. Next slide. Um, and what we found was that at fifty percent, you can see here that when you have fifty percent buckwheat in the mix, the saw the growth of your plants are much lower. There's fewer, there's less um, uh, root matter there, the plants are smaller, and you see that with sunflower, sorghum, sudan grass, with, uh, with alfalfa, but not with rye grass. Rye grass actually grew better in the presence of buckwheat. That was with 50%. Next slide. Uh, with 20% buckwheat, what we found that it was not, was not uh, affecting the, the growth of the plants as much if you just had 20% of the field rate of buckwheat in your mix. So that gave us some really good information of, on its allelopathic effects. But what happens as far as um, wire worms are concerned? So next slide, please. What we found was that it didn't matter if you had 100% buckwheat or 20% buckwheat. There was no difference in wire worm mortality. And wire worm mortality was significantly higher than if you didn't have buckwheat in the in the mix. So this was this was good news for us. So we know that we, we could go as low as 20%, not have allelopathic effects on our other plants and still get wire worm suppression. We looked at the weight of the wire worms. Next slide. Uh, and what we found was uh, that the weight also was was lower in all at all levels of uh, of buckwheat, all rates of buckwheat, and although not significantly lower than than the no buckwheat um, control, but there was a trend for it to be lower. So this was really good information for us. This led to us, uh, next slide please. This led to us doing a mixed cover crop trial where we used several other crops like sorghum, sudan, grass peas, basilia, uh, fodder radish, and we mixed in this either 25% buckwheat 25 or 25% um, uh, brown mustard in these mixes. And this time when we went to the field, we had these really big plots and they were like a quarter of an acre. So we divided, up, divided it into a tilled area and an, a min tilled area. The reason for doing this was that we know 
from research being done all across the world that and there's lots of evidence that minimum tillage actually increases wireworm populations in in the field now this is not not good because we need we, if the more you till your field, the more you, you lose soil. And for soil health purposes, minimum tillage is, is, is a good practice. Um, so we thought, well, how can we use a mix in a minimum till it, tilled area and actually get, get suppression? So this was a strategy that we thought would, were, would be good one to follow up on and put that buckwheat in at 25% and see if we could get still get wireworm suppression in a min tilled field. So that was done in 2021. In 2022, we will be planting our potatoes and I'll have some more information next year about how this whole strategy has worked. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, movement of wireworms because I'll bet you know why it's important. We wanted to see when the wireworms are available at the surface to get a correct um, indication of the populations in the field, to bait the field and know exactly how much, how uh, high the populations are. But we know that they go down in the in the in the winter, and then they come back up in the in the spring. So next slide, please. So we, we did this study where we put this these um, sorry where we put these um, temperature graphs. So we were also monitoring temperature in these tubes. They were in the soil, and we took them out every uh, every uh, two we every month. We took them out, and we were looking at where the wire ones were, and and then we related it to the temperature. And as you can see, the temperature, as the temperature drops, the wireworms keep going down. But as the temperature starts to go up in April, um, in our area, it's in April, temperature starts to go up and it's at, at eight to 10 degree, degrees is when you start to see wireworms at the surface. So what we, we're telling our growers here is, there's no point in going in April when the temperature, soil temperature is still low and baiting a field to find out what your population is, because you're going to get a false uh, indication of what your population is. It's best to go when the temperature, soil temperatures are above 10. And we know this, this is, this movement of wireworms is the same for a lot of the species. So in your area, it would be good to know what the temperatures, when the temperatures at 10, so that when you Bait, you bait at the right time to actually get a proper indication of what your populations are. There's also another baiting time, which is September. If, if it's possible to bait in September, most of the time the wire ones are at the surface, they're feeding at that time, getting ready to go into, into diapers or into uh, to overwinter. So September would be also a good time to bait, bait fields to know. It's very important to know what your population is and then decide on what strategy you're going to use. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge all uh, funding agencies and also the growers that are uh, that have participated in these trials with us. Uh, this is my team, and that's the information I have for um, my information there. So if you ever want to call me or um, send me an email, you're more than welcome to do so. Thanks. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, I know I, I'm not sure how prevalent wireworm is, but I know it is. I know of one farmer who, who unfortunately experienced it, and it's very devastating. Um, so I really appreciate, um, you know, the the information that you've shared today, and we'll definitely keep in touch um, for vegetable growers and for grain growers, because I think you know some of your research, especially on cover croppings, with cover cropping, um, will be of interest to to grain farmers as well. So. Thank you yes. so much. Yes, yeah. And our, our vegetable growers are also using this because this kind of strategy can be used any for any farming. Absolutely. Farming. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah no, mm -hmm. absolutely. No, it's absolutely relevant for vegetable growers yeah. too. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, we do have a few questions and a few minutes left. So yeah, I'm just sure. going to go through um, and we'll just, we'll invite um, Deborah back as well. Um, and also just to, to let folks know who are on the call that if you don't get a chance or if we don't get a chance to ask your question here now, um, there will be an opportunity tomorrow in the, in the networking groups as well. So, um, okay. So one of the questions, will tillage, will tillage used terminate a trap cover crop for cabbage maggot to kill the maggots? Well, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, not all, it might kill a few, but it, not a lot, um, because you're, you're counting on a physical method to hit them and they're small. So it's, it's not the greatest. Um, and that is just one of the limitations. I, and I think that's really why, um, our farm decided to go with, with animals as well. Um, it can help, but you're still, just be aware that they're going to be, they might be reduced, but not gone. Right. And then there's a, a follow on question really. Uh, so if you, um, if you do not have pigs to terminate radish cover crops, can they be composted or do you need to remove them from the farm? Yeah, these are some of the real challenges for, so some of the things you would need to do to control a pest are really not good for organic production. Um, you know, composting is better than, than nothing. Um, it, and especially I think if you take it out, if you, uh, if it's a late crop and, and the, the, the pest is not going to emerge again until the spring, you know, you've got all that winter for the compost to heat up and kill it. I, I, it's, it's better than nothing. Um, it's not always perfect. I think you, you know, what maybe you can do, you know, it's going to be hard to do that, but just watch for them. If it's maggot, for instance, if you can get good at identifying that band on the thorax, that, that gray band, and, and online you'll, you'll be able to find a lot of pictures of it, and you have some sticky traps up around your compost you pile, you can actually watch it in the spring and see if, if anything looks like a, a cabbage maggot coming out of that pile and see how effective that is. Or like they, they really come out in the spring and the fall, so in the midsummer it's not going to be a problem. And it may be that if you compost um, um, a trap crop through the summer when they're not really out anyway, it might they might degrade enough to kill them so that they don't come out in the fall. But I would I would try and monitor that if at all possible, and and maybe the only way to do that is with the sticky traps. Okay, thank you. Not entirely uh, satisfactory, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, thank you for that. Um, and then one more question for you, Deborah. Have you used mineral oils to control aphids in vegetable crops? Um, I haven't personally. I know that they're very good, like a heavy oil is very good in the winter for woody crops. Um, it is definitely worth a try because what oil will do is smother the aphid. And, and honestly, what soap does is it just kind of breaks their, their surface tension. And so none of those are really chemical fixes. They're physical um, you know, impacts. And I would definitely give it a try. And, and what you should do is like check before and after. Spray some water on, on like, and don't forget your control. Spray some water on something, spray some, some summer oil on, on another batch with aphids, and then, then a, couple, a day or so later, go and look and see. And if the aphids are all shriveled up and dark, you, you did a good job. And as long as your crop's still happy, you know, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that, that is uh, the last question that's come into the chat. And we're pretty much right at 1230. So uh, at least in Saskatchewan, um, we're at 1230. So that brings us to the end of uh, day one. So thank you uh, so much to our speakers for your presentations. And thank you for all your questions and engagement from the folks who have joined us here today.